hi everyone today we are going to learn about the modern art movements so very briefly i'm going to explain about all these art movements the first movement that started was realism that was followed by impressionism post impressionism fauvism cubism expressionism primitivism surrealism abstract expressionism and pop art so these are not the only isms that were there in the modern art movements there were many more that were there but these were the prominently done art movements and the artists who followed these were more famous than the rest so starting with realism realism could also be taken as naturalism in the arts it's generally the attempt to represent subject matter truthfully without artificiality and avoiding artistic conventions or impulsive exotic and supernatural elements realism has been prevalent in the arts at many periods and can be in large part a matter of technique and training and the avoidance of stylization so basically we are taking off after renaissance baroque and then when we came towards the naturalistic representation of art and the last artist that we had learned in this was william turner no right from if you remember the hunters in the snow as well as the wedding dance the conceptual uh, following in the art itself had completely changed and that developed into a peak during this realism the first artist that we are going to learn about realism is gustav courbe there are two important paintings of courbe that we are going to learn here the first one is burial adornments if you can see after the wedding dance here now we have come to a concept that is totally different a concept that was never represented earlier which is a burial burial is an activity that happens in every community time to time everywhere and here we have gustav courbe who has captured the scene at burial at orleans so here if you can see it's a group that is there and the group is comfortably communicating with each other in the frame that he has done and the, the color combination is actually quite early and there is not any much sense of perspective or space or anything over here he has realistically captured the moment of the burial being done the next example that we can see is of the stone cutters now where we were having only kings being depicted or gods being depicted or angels being depicted here for a change we have common labor men which are stone cutters in their day to day activity in their rugged dresses you know their torn dresses the tonsure dresses uh, being involved in an activity that just needs to give them their labor so the realism is actually realistic representation of the concepts that were there in the community the next art movement is impressionism impressionism is a 19th century art movement characterized by relatively small thin yet visible brush strokes there were open composition emphasis on accurate depiction of light and its changing qualities often accentuating the effects of the passage of time ordinary subject matter inclusion of movement as a crucial element of human perception and experience and an unusual visual angle that these impressionistic artists did the most famous impressionistic artist that we are going to learn about is claude monet Monet was a French painter, and uh, the entire term impressionism is so started by this painting of Monet, which is called the Impression Sunrise. Here, as we read earlier, you can see these are just dabs of brush strokes, dabs of colors that create the entire painting. He has shown a small ship or a, inside the uh, the sea that he has shown but then there is no sense of space or perspective there is a complete overlap of the sky with the sea and the whole thing he has just done with dabs of colors and this painting was exhibited in the in, in an famous exhibition and there the people kept the name for this as impressionism and then the entire art movement of impressionism started as you can see the techniques is just thick and thin strokes and a play of light and color that creates the entire image and how he captures the natural light the next example of monet is his rouen cathedral 
if you can see it's an architectural structure an architectural structure is supposed to have perfect lines both verticality and horizontal lines perfect structure but here he has completely distorted the building with the strokes and the dabs that he has done and this the facade is when he that uh, when he has represented the light during sunset on the facade just after impressionism is the phase where post impressionism would started post impressionism prevailed during 1880s and several artists began to develop different perceptions of the use of color pattern form and line now representing naturalism to realism and here now we are moving into a phase where we were representing color form line that created a pattern in the image a visual effect that was created rather than an objective effect that was created now this effects were derived from the impressionistic examples of vincent van gogh paul gauguin george sera and henry de los lotre now sera's paintings were very interesting and he ventured into another form of art which was called pointillism where his entire painting was created just with dots the different dots of colors that were there and uh, in fact if he, he used the uh, the color chart that was there if you need to do a secondary color he would just have two dabs of primary colors placed next to each other that created the secondary color and that was called the pointillistic style now these artists were slightly younger than the impressionistic and their work is known as post impressionism and cezanne who participated in the first and third impressionistic exhibitions developed a highly individual vision emphasizing pictorial structure so that's the important word over here when we come to post impressionism a pictorial structure that created the entire painting uh, the first artist we are going to learn is van gogh van gogh is a very interesting artist and one of my favorite artists among all these he died pretty young and uh, he mostly did this paintings in seclusion he lived in a farmland far away from the uh, hustle bustle of the uh, city and uh, it was his brother who supported him in this movements and by providing him with paints and all that these are the early sketches of van gogh uh, this is a famous painting of his which is called potato eaters now here again if you can see he has created these images only with color dabs now this is called sunflowers this is one of the most famous painting in the entire art movement because it was one of the earliest that was auctioned for a very high value but unfortunately the auction did not happen during the lifetime of van gogh it happened much later so he actually could not monetarily benefit from his paintings but then his paintings are now are quite famous as long as he lived he lived in poverty and he died among several canvases that he had created and uh, in fact uh, the sad part of the story is that he shot himself in the field now this is another very famous painting of him which is called night cafe now here the interesting thing is you should see the way he has represented the light around the bulb that he has shown so this is a series of dabs of concentric brush strokes around the bulb that create the light there is a sense of nice perspective that he has done the objects are well placed the space is well a custom but then it's only with variation of these dabs that van gogh creates his post impressionistic style of painting now this is his most important painting which is called the starry night this is often been recreated in many interiors it has often been recreated in many postcards and art forms and here you can see the starry night that he has done is this the twinkling stars how he has shown the twinkling stars the same concept that he used in the bulb is what he used over here with concentric circles of dabs again with a series of waves that he had created on the night sky and the, the color combination if you can see is again very subtle and uh, van gogh is uh, quite famous for using a lot of yellows he was somehow very fond of yellows and most of his paintings were done with yellows these are some of his self portraits the next artist of post impressionistic era is paul cezanne and uh, cezanne actually started to do post impressionism and towards the end of his uh, career his paintings move little towards the cubistic structure now he did a lot of still lives 
many still lives, uh, especially to do with uh, fruits and basket arrangements. But then he did not do a naturalistic representation of them. We will see the pictures a little later. This is boy in a red vest. If you can observe the boy very keenly, the red vest is very dark by which the name of the painting has come. But he actually disfigured the proportions of the physiological uh, features of the body. The head seems to be a little smaller than the torso that is there and one hand seems to be dislocated or disproportionately placed on his hip whereas the other hand is very broadly available. Probably this was a uh, uh, form of his impressionistic representation of the human body and if you can see this painting depicts a boy in a traditional Italian attire. Here the right arm is way out of proportion with egg-shaped head and metallic appearance of a body and clothes. So the overall composition is perfectly balanced. Now this is the sea at Elestark. Elestark is the place where he stayed and this was the beautiful scenery he could see from his living or from his dwelling and he has done several canvases on this sea at Elestark during sunset, during sunrise, nighttime, daytime, in different uh, weather conditions he has captured this Elestar. Now the still life which I spoke to you a little earlier about, now, these are the famous still lives of uh, Cezanne. He had done several series of these as well. So, so if you can see again, uh, it's only the colors that represent the orange or the apple, not the true sense of an naturalistic representation of the apple. But then the play of light and the positioning of the objects is what is very interesting in all Cezanne's still lives. Now, this is another St. Victor, which was a view from the place you were saying. He has done several canvases on the St. Victor, Mont St. Victor as well. Some of his earlier watercolors. Some of his earlier self-portraits. Now, just after the post-impressionism is where we started with Fauvism as an art movement. Now, the very word for le for is a French word which means wild beast. So when we talk about wild beast, it is not in this real sense of a beast, but it's more related to colors, a wild depiction of colors that was done in the fauvistic paintings. The group of early 20th century modern artists whose works emphasized painterly qualities and strong color over the representational and realistic values retained by Impressionism. So that the realism was far more and more depreciating as the other art movements were coming into existence. So while Fauvism as a style began around 1904 and continued beyond 1910, the movement as such lasted only a few years, 1905 to 1908, and had three exhibitions. The leaders of this movement were Andre de Rain and Henry Matisse. So we are going to learn only about Matisse and his paintings here. Now, Henry Matisse is again a very famous artist. That is uh, Matisse at his later stage. He did print painting, printmaking, sculptures, drawings, as well as collage. These are one of his early paintings where he has done a, a table setting of a food arrangement being done. These are some very important paintings of Matisse, which are portraits of people that he had done. Here you can see the portraits are more an assemblage of colors together that create the shape or that create the portrait of the person itself. It's not a very naturalistic representation. And probably here is where you can see a bit of the animation had already started in the 19th century. And uh, this is uh, Madame Matisse. Uh, if you can see how dramatically he has done the hairdress of Madame Matisse and the way the contour of the face has just been done with the color patches that he has done. These are some other examples of Matisse. Now the red door. Sorry, the red room. The red room is what is a very important painting of Matisse, which created a lot of controversies and uh, made him very famous in the art field. Now, here you can see what he has done is that 
He has merged the table along with the wall that is there behind it. If you could look very keenly into this painting, it is actually an interior space that he has tried to represent. The interior space that has a window that is from where we are able to look at the garden beyond the room. And there is a chain, chair over here and this chair seems to have uh, a perfect sense of perspective in which he has drawn a three-dimensional object of the chair you can see. But then the table has completely merged with the wall and he has created uh, a pattern, a pattern of floral flowing uh, veins which actually flows from the table into the wall. So that is what was interesting in Mati's painting. And these are some other examples where you can see the foreground, the background, the main object and the behind object were all matched into different patterns. Just after Fauvism is where we move into Cubism, the most important art movement in the entire modern art history is this Cubistic form of painting that the artist had developed. Now the Cubistic artwork objects are analyzed, broken up and resembled in an abstracted form. So here for the first time you hear this word abstracted, we've very commonly heard abstract art but then this is where it started from and how it has started as if there is an object that object was uh, split into or segmented into various shapes that were assembled back together and they created the shape which is basically the essence of cubism instead of depicting objects from a single viewpoint the artist depicts the object from a multitude of viewpoints to represent the object in a greater context let's see some examples to understand what this means the most famous artist here who we are going to learn about the cubistic uh, painters are Pablo Picasso. All of you must have heard this name several times. Picasso is one person who you wouldn't have been without hearing about. Uh, more because of the controversial art concepts that he brought into several exhibitions is what he is famous for. Uh, these are some of his early works, the portrait of his parents here you can see already the representation of cubistic art form has started now here you can see just several shapes with different colors that form into the lady and the guitar that are there These are some of his developmental art. So if you can see, it represents a bit of the crafty art that exists now. It also represents a bit of the animation art that exists now. This is something that long back Picasso had already started thinking about. These are some portraits of Picasso. And here you can see what he does very commonly is he disfigures the face. He segments the face. He breaks them into several parts. You can see the eyes, the right, right eye to the left eye has been replaced or the eye, one is big, one is small, or one is in the frontal view and one is in the side view. So these are what created the cubistic arts or the abstract arts of Picasso. Uh, yeah, Picasso's art is actually differentiated into various segments where we have the blue period, the pink period, but we are not getting into detail of all that. Here you can see again two human forms that he has done in a further abstract form where there are just lines that creates the shape of the figure and assembles together to form the image or the painting. Here is another example of perfect segmentation and reassemblage of the objects. This is the famous painting of Picasso the Marcel's the Avignon. Here you can see a series of, uh, sorry, a group of uh, five ladies who 
are being represented and each of the figure uh, if you know the uh, contour of a uh, female body is what has been very commonly represented or very popularly represented by most of the artists and here you have picasso who has completely disfigured the female form the contours are absolutely lost with the segmentation of the images that he has done and the, the color combination as well he gave all of them just the skin tone and uh, put them all in a background The next phase was expressionism and uh, expressionism is initially uh, was also famous in poetry as well as painting it originated from germany at the beginning of the 20th century its uh, typical trait is to present the world solely from a subjective perspective distorting it radically from emotional effect in order to evoke moods or ideas so here if you can see we are more moving towards the concept of the painting or the subject of the painting rather than how it was depicted whether it was a naturalistic depiction or an abstract depiction or just with colors or with shapes so that was not important as much as the subject of the painting was important expressionistic artists have sought to express the meaning of emotional experience rather than the physical reality the artist we are going to learn in as in the expressionistic art movement is edward munch this is edward munch a uh, famous quote by munch he was a norwegian expressionistic artist i will not paint what i see but what i saw this is munch's a uh, baseline of his art movement uh, these are the series of paintings that he had done the first one of them is called the despair now the this entire series had a kind of a bridge that was shown probably bridge that is there in the life the far end uh, of the horizon and then a series of uh, harmonious colors that he used or a uh, monotone of colors that he used with a dash of an contrasting color in his painting this is melancholy anxiety again you can see the same bridge kind of a setup with this uh, the uh, horizon that he had depicted a vampire this is the important painting that you need to know about munch which is called the scream it is popularly also known as the cry here we see the same bridge again and then a person who has been solitarily standing in the front either with astonishment or with surprise or with disgust or with despair we really don't know what uh, was the reason for this kind of an expression that he gave to the stripper that he has depicted over here but then whatever it is it perfectly fits the title the scream and you can see the same way he has shown a perfect blend of the horizon the orange sky probably representing the sunset or the sunrise that is there and the river that flows below this bridge now this bridge could be represented symbolically as to many obstacles that we cross through our life the self portrait of them after expressionism was primitivism now primitivism in the 20th century when we say primitivism it really doesn't take us back into the era doesn't take us back into the stone age where we had the nomads uh, but here the term primitivism is often applied to other professional painters working in a style of nave or folk art so this is when as we see history repeats itself now we saw folk art repeating itself in the modern art era as well now there were quite a few famous artists who did this uh, primitivistic art and one of the famous artists that we are going to learn now is henry rousseau now rousseau was a french artist uh, but he had a lot of influence from the folk arts from the native 
uh, countries close by. Uh, some of them were very deeply influenced by the tropical forest. Now here you can see is where he has shown a tiger in a tropical forest. The tiger is actually lost within this uh, foliage of uh, thick green uh, trees that he has shown in and around. Now here the tiger and the buffalo is lost in them. Now this is a very famous painting of Russo. This is called the Sleeping Gypsy. Here you can see, it's, uh, we could identify that it's probably an African man, both with his attire as well as the texture of his uh, skin tone. Now here it seems to be like he is a gypsy who is just probably uh, nomading around and he has laid down to take a rest. And then you see this huge African lion who is passing by with him. So this is called the sleeping gypsy. After primitivism is where we move on to surrealism. This movement is best known for its visual artworks. And uh, this is the term you should remember, juxtaposition. And juxtaposition is where probably you're just placing images next to each other to create an imagery. Uh, probably like what you do in your collage. Artists painted unnerving, illogical scenes. Sometimes with photographic precision, creating strange creatures from everyday objects. So here now you can see we're moving on to painting things that were not realistic at all. And uh, developing painting techniques that alert the unconscious, what is there in your unconscious, what is there in your subconscious, what is your highest level of imagination and that to express it. Its aim was to resolve the previously contradictory conditions of dream and reality into an absolute reality which is called a super reality so it's it's a blend of what you can imagine uh, out of what you see in your day-to-day -day life works of surrealism features the element of surprise unexpected juxtapositions and non-sequential the most important artist is salvador dali uh, after Picasso, Dali is another famous artist who everybody uh, looks for a lot of inspiration because these were two people who completely thought out of the box who moved into a total different form of representation. This is a very famous painting of Dali. And uh, if you can actually see, he has depicted the room, the interior of the room in the form of a lady's face. The swags and the curtains, he has curled into her uh, hair, the entrance into her chin, the sofa inside the room is actually in the form of the lips which is very often uh, taken as a inspiration for most of the interiors that they've done. The fireplace, the heart, the, the heart of any room in the European countries you have shown with the nose and then two paintings to represent the eyes. This is Dali. Yes, he had a very uh, different kind of an approach in the way he represented himself also. He had a very different moustache. Now, he was often known as the difference between me and a man mad. This, I am not mad. This is what he used to call himself. Uh, these are a couple of his early paintings. Yes, here you can see the cubistic influence that he got from Picasso into his paintings. And this completely moved towards this surrealistic composition of artwork that Dali came up with. Now, this is his famous painting, which is called The Persistence of Memory. This was done in 1931. It is an oil on canvas that he had done. Now here, if you can see, there is actually this hide of a horse that has been kind of stripped and lying there lifeless. And you also have these watches or clocks at different uh, angles being represented over here. And each one shows the same timeline that is there. But then he kind of brought melting clocks over here. 
Now, these melting clocks probably represents his memories, either maybe the bad memories or there may be some memories that are unforgettable. The time that is frozen in those memories in the form of this melting watches and the kind of a dramatic scene amidst which he has placed these melting rocks in this height and one branch of this dried up tree that is here. These are the complete perfect example of a surrealistic concept of painting that Dali could have come up with. Here's another example of Dali. Metamorphosis is again another famous painting of Dali. Yes, after surrealism is where we uh, came into a phase of abstract expressionism. And the most famous artist in abstract expressionism is Jackson Pollock. Now, Jackson Pollock was an American painter. He was very influential because he came up with his complete own style. And these are his abstract art movements that he had done. And uh, not essential that Pollock had specific names for his artwork or concept. Now, his art was completely abstract. It only had shapes and colors flowing. And uh, in abstract art, there are no real life images, scenery, or objects. You can't find all these three in Pollock's artworks. His artworks are very famous. And this is how initially he started working. But then later on, he discovered this technique of pouring paint on the canvas or it was called the dripper and uh, he was also commonly known as Jack the Dripper. Uh, he enjoyed this considerable uh, fame that he got by this form of an art where he just literally poured the paints onto his canvas. He did not use any brushes, he did not use any. Now, this is a very famous uh, artwork of Polak. And this painting was sold for dollar 140 million in 2006. This artwork is called Lavender Mist, which he did in 1950s. This is called Blue Poles. Then in 1952, Autumn Rhythm. Then in 1950. Here you can see the artist himself on work. He just had these kind of containers of paint and then he poured over them onto his canvases. His canvases are really large, very huge. Here again you can see how he has been just dribbling the paint onto his canvas. That's why he was called Jack the Ripper. Now, this is a very interesting form of art, which is actually called pop art. Uh, by the term that suggests pop itself, it means it is a very popular art. The popular art was shrunk and commonly called as pop art. Now, immediately after pop art, there was another form of art, which is called op art. Op art is actually optical art. So we are not having any example of that here. The optical art is where you can see the illusionistic movement in the paintings. Now, here in pop art, the very famous artist is Andy Warhol. Now, Andy Warhol had this kind of um, representation in his paintings where uh, he would probably repeat the object, repeat the object several times to create the painting. Now, his influence was more on the graphic art because he also did graphic art for a bit of his uh, livelihood, like uh, art on the tin cans and all this. This tin cans influenced him a lot. The magazine art influenced him a lot. And this is his very famous painting, which is based on Merlin Monroe. Now, uh, when Monroe died, uh, of course, most of the people all around the world were very deeply affected. So he took a photograph of hers and represent that in this form of a uh, nine uh, different contrast and variations that he could give in the tone of his photograph and this became a very famous painting and uh, this was done in 1962. So here the concept was repetition, number one. Number two, the different variations of tone that he can give 
into the same image but representing it in various contrasts. Uh, again, uh, the, this is the tomato soup. Probably he used to have very often, and he was so into and uh, he was so attracted by this that he tried creating another painting using these uh, the uh, wraparounds of the can, and uh, he created them into this kind of an artwork. Now, Andy Warhol again was very interested in representing himself in various hairstyles and various forms, and he often did this kind of artwork as well. These were all the artists that we saw, and uh, the last amongst this modern art movement that we are going to learn is uh, one sculptor called Rodin. Now, Rodin was a modern sculptor or a sculptor from the modern art phase because he did artwork which was very different from the sculptures that we could see from the uh, Michelangelo's face. And uh, Michelangelo's uh, statues were perfect to the physiological representation that he could do of any structure. Now, the first example that we're going to learn over here is the gates of hell. Now, in the gates of hell, if you can see, he has uh, camouflaged this door and the top crease of the door along with the vertical jams that are there completely into several figures. Now, since it's called the gate or probably named as the gates of hell after he done this because because he had shown a lot of agony in each of the sculptures he had shown them with um, uh, being uh, tortured or being um, taken through probably what would happen in hell after the soul reaches over there that kind of a representation so it was named as the gates of hell as well now this thinker that we saw at the top of the gate. Now here is where you can see a human body where the proportions of the body are perfect. But then he is very famous for giving this kind of an unfinished look. Generally when a sculpture is done, the sculpture has been uh, grinded, polished, uh, refined and then brought to the presentation. But here he brought the sculpture in its crudest stage in the manufactured stage as well. Like you can see the chisel marks also on the, uh, the, the, the skin or the texture that is there. And uh, he really did not bother much about the fine finishing, about polishing and grinding his sculpture before he brought them into display. Now the second example of uh, Rodin is the Burgers of Calais. Here it is a group, a group of uh, people who he is shown into this thing each one facing differently. Now here, it's not that the group is uh, completely facing the audience that is watching them. They, it's a complete three-dimensional figure. And each one is in a different action. Each one is showing a different emotion. But here again, if you can see, he really did not bother to finish the sculpture by grinding and polishing them. He left the chisel marks, he left the welding marks. He left it to be in its crude and rugged form. So that's about uh, how the sculpture could be made. Just a bit of process to understand what Rodin did with this artwork. And, uh, that's about for modern art movements and uh, all the best to you.